The American automotive industry struggled with the rise of emission controls, safety regulations and the ever-growing foreign competition. What followed was a dark period known as the Malaise era. But not everything made during the Malaise era was bad. Today we're going to take a look at the greatest hits from the Malaise era. Welcome everyone to episode 20 of the automotive history series devoted to the Malaise era. And this is part 3. The Revival of the American Automotive Industry Welcome back to part 3 of this 3 part episode. The last two episodes strongly focused on what went wrong during the Malays era. Now it's time to focus on the good stuff. By the early to mid 80s the American auto industry finally found its place in the new world of regulations and emission controls. But even during the darkest times back in the 70s there were already some good efforts. There is a bit of a debate going on when the Malays era ended. Some say it clearly ended in 1983 with the advent of computer controlled vehicles. Others say it was 1987 because of the national speed limit being raised to 65 miles per hour. And then there are people that say that the Malays era lasted well into the 90s. For me it's kind of like a bipolar disorder. Some days I wake up thinking oh yeah 1983 the US car industry finally got their mojo back. And some days I wake up thinking oh man. Man, the Malays era really lasted well into the 90s, didn't it? Anyway, this is uh, what keeps me up at night. The sole reason for me to think that the Malays era lasted well into the 90s is because of this car, the 1992 Cadillac Brougham. This is like a lazy chair on wheels and then Cadillac has the balls to openly complain about the grandpa image. This is a grandpa car, 1992. You're effectively looking at a car that was released in 1977. This is a car with a 15 year old design, inside and out and also under the hood. Today's equivalent would be walking into a caddy dealership and buying a Cadillac DTS from 2006. New. No. Oh yeah, so, sorry, 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 I, we, we would focus on the good stuff in this episode. And truth to be told is that you can't depend the end of a whole era based on one single car. I'm well aware of that. Remember in the first part of this episode I talked about the five steps the American industry took to survive the Malays era? Well here is step number six. If you can't be them, join them. And that's what they did. US car makers finally came to terms in the mid 70s that they were never going to win it against the Asian imports. So they decided to team up with them instead. Through the practice of joint ventures and rebadging, American car makers got the chance to sell Asian cars that were not Toyota and Nissan under their own brand and logo to meet the ever more stringent regulations. And in return, the Asian car makers had a chance to break into the US car market. Welcome to Ed's Auto Erotica Dating Show. Ford started a loving relationship with Mazda by selling the B-Series as the Ford Career. GM began dating with the Japanese company Isuzu by selling the Isuzu Faster as the Chevrolet LUV. And later on the Chevette was sold as the Isuzu Gemini. AMC had a one-night stand with the French car maker Renault and they had a baby called the Renault Alliance. And Chrysler, <laughs> you old womanizer, had a threesome with the French Simca and Japanese Mitsubishi. And that's what I want to focus on as one of the bright spots in these dark days. Chrysler was going steadily downhill in the latest 70s. In the early 70s they didn't even try at making a compact economy car. Instead they imported the Hillman Avenger and sold it as the rebadged Plymouth Crickets, which turned out to be a bad idea. Then they decided to drop the highly successful Dart slash Valiant line not true compact but dead reliable midsizers and replacing them with their homegrown attempt at creating a compact car, the Aspen and Volare, which turned out to be a bad idea. But finally, finally the much needed smash hit was here, the 1978 Dodge Omni and the related Plymouth Horizon. This is probably one of the closest attempts at creating a European sized compact car with similar engine and fuel economy. But the Omni wasn't an all American effort, but more so a 
world car based on the Chrysler Europe's Simcat Talbot Horizon. Or at least it was developed in Europe, but with the European and American market in mind. As soon as the foundations were laid, the American designers could shape the car to meet the American regulations. Euro engineering, like front wheel drive, back then only associated with land yards like the Cadillac Eldorados, combined with American touches, like an automatic transmission and a different suspension setup. The car was a huge hit. Just take a look. On your left, an Omni, a Euro-engineered compact car, and on your right, an Aspen, an all-American-engineered compact car. Americans, as it turns out, could make a small car that was not based or trying to look like larger American models. And at the end of the 70s, Chrysler had a head start. And a much needed one at that, because around 1980, Chrysler was almost bankrupt. Some sweet money was coming in because of the Omni, but almost all other Chrysler models were lackluster, slow sellers. Until Lee Iacocca stepped in. Lee had this idea, what if we simplify production? See, for the longest time, American car makers had separate tooling, bodies, equipment, engines and mechanicals for each of their divisions. When you had a Chevrolet, you had a car that only shared its parts within Chevrolet. GM blundered heavily with this in the mid-70s by installing Chevrolet engines in Oldsmobile models. Car mechanics were confused and cars were more commonly found at service garages than at the garages at home. Sorry, 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 we, we would be talking about the good stuff. Bad Edward. You can probably imagine that it becomes a costly affair to have separate parts and tooling for every division in your corporate lineup. This had to be streamlined to bring down cost. Lee figured that what Chrysler should do in order to avoid bankruptcy is to come up with one and the same platform and expand from there. It it comes down to this. Your local pizza joint has decided to rework their menu. Instead of a very long list of different types of pizzas, which do not really differ a lot from each other, you can now customize your own pizza by adding toppings on a round piece of dough. The dough is the K-platform. The toppings are Chrysler divisions and their respective models. Sedans, coupes, sporty coupes, convertibles, family wagons, ornate business sedans, and even this new thing called minivans were based on the one and only K platform. Over 50 Chrysler models were based or related to the K platform. From a modern day perspective, these cars are looking as generic as they could get in the 80s, but you have to remember that a lot of cars were boxy in the 80s, and this was a crisp and sharp design. This, along with the Omni, were truly the much-needed hits for Chrysler. It saved the company from bankruptcy, and by the late 80s, Chrysler sold some 12 million cars related to the K platform. Let's move over to GM. By the early 80s, GM finally worked out how to make cars that complied with the rules. One example is the Chevrolet Caprice for 1977. GM realized that, hmm, maybe our cars are getting a bit too big. The thing is, the new 77 Caprice replaced a huge and bloated 76 Caprice. And the 76 was huge in exterior dimensions, but with an interior that is not all that spacious as it might look like from the outside. You start to wonder where all this space went, but okay. The new downsized 77 Caprice was the other way around. The car was designed with a more spacious interior in mind and a smaller exterior around it. The Caprice was not a compact economy car, quite the opposite in fact, but it set the bar for the new generation of full-size American cars. Full size, but a bit smaller. It was still as traditional as ever, using tried and true architecture, engine in the front, power to the back, but in a much lighter package. As a result, the car was more fuel efficient without losing any more of its power, although you can't really get any lower than 145 horsepower from a 5 liter V8. The generation lasted all the way until 1990, almost unchanged and sold in great numbers to fleet services, like taxis and police cars. But there is more. By the start of the 80s, GM felt a bit more confident and started experimenting in a good way, introducing Buick. By the mid-80s, Buick offered the Regal, an upscale mid-sizer with oh, V6 as a standard engine. It is your average luxomobile, chrome accents, triple brown color, the works. Pretty boring, right? Wrong. 
GM sent Buick to the racetrack with a beefed-up Regal with a V6, which had a turbocharger. Okay, The Buick T-Type proved to be a racing success, and what wins on Sunday sells on Monday. GM went all in on the sporty Buick and proceeded to create even crazier performance versions of the Regal, like the Grand National, limited edition T-Turbo, and finally, the almighty blacked-out GNX. The GNX was the one to have. 300 horsepower from a turbocharged 3.8 liter V6. 0 to 60 in less than 5 seconds. This car was faster than some Ferrari and Porsche models. Impressive for a car that would otherwise be driven by a grandpa. Performance was no longer a bad word that could only be achieved by there is no replacement for displacement gas guzzling V8. Instead, it could also be achieved by modest six or even four cylinder engines with the help of high tech stuff like turbocharging and electronic fuel injection. Ooh, the Buick was a prime example of this. The second muscle car war had started, and Buick wasn't the only one. Ford entered with the new Mustang SVO, powered by a modest 2.3 liter four-cylinder, making 200 horsepower in 1986. A very respectable power output, even by today's standards. Chrysler also joined by asking Carroll Shelby for help with the Dodge Omni, which I mentioned before. The end result was the Dodge Omni GLH, which stands for for goes like hell and the GLH S which stands for goes like hell some more Americans and car names <laughs> I tell you, man. The GLHS had 175 horsepower from a 2.2 liter turbocharged four cylinder and a 0 to 60 time of under 7 seconds, a serious hot hatch, and a real competitor to the Volkswagen Golf GTI. But back to Ford. While American car makers progressed under the hood, design wise, many of their standard models still look boxy and rather traditional, especially compared to European models. This was not helped by the government. See, when it comes to car design, the entire world had moved on to the world form of harmonization of vehicle regulations, except the US, which still uses the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, which became more and more of an obstacle. Things like flush-mounted headlights, pretty standard on European cars by the mid-80s, weren't allowed. Instead, old-fashioned rectangular headlights were still in use. Ford figured that besides downsizing and making an engine more technologically advanced, Aerodynamics could also play a huge role in making cars more fuel efficient and therefore meet the CAFE standards. Watch part 2 for more information about it. After some time of constant nagging, the US government gave car designers a bit more freedom and Ford made great use of it with the introduction of the Ford Taurus in 1985. The Taurus was a radical departure of what was considered standard at the time. Almost no grill, instead a bottom breather. No rectangular headlights, but hidden behind sleek looking glass, and above all, a very aerodynamic body. This, along with the European Audi, was one of the cars that launched car design into the 90s. No more corners and boxiness, but smooth lines and rounded off corners. Whereas many other American cars still looked like they more belonged in the 70s, the Taurus looked like they belonged in the 90s. And if this video would be endless, we would now slowly sink into the 90s. But you know what? Screw this. I'm going to make a part 4, where we are going to look beyond the 1980s and discuss the lasting effect of the Malaise era on the US auto industry, all the way until the present day.